Now I would like to introduce today's speaker, this lovely person I was talking to. Her name is Sarah Wasberg Johnson. She is the food historian. She is also an author, educator, podcaster, and blogger of all things related to food history. A, few, a frequent interviewee of journalists looking for historical context. She was featured in all three episodes of the History Channel miniseries called The Food That America Built. And she has been featured on NPR, The Atlantic, CNN, Atlas Obscura, and more. She's published in the New York History Journal and the Agricultural History Journal, and is currently finalizing editing her book, which is called Preserve a Parish, Food in New York State During the Great War, which was between 1916 to 1919. Uh, Sarah received her MA in history, public his in history and public history from the University of Albany, State University of New York. And she has a BA in history and Scandinavian studies from Concordia College in Minnesota. So please welcome Sarah. Thank you. Uh, and so the talk is cooking by the book, Celebrity Chef Cookbookery and the Changing Landscape of American Cuisine. Um, and I, if, if I put everything in the 200 years approximately of history that we're gonna be talking about tonight, this would probably be a five hour talk. <laughs> so uh, we are gonna skip some stuff. It's basically the cookbooks and cookbook authors that I think were either influential in American food or that are kind of reflective of American food and how cookbooks um, are both reflective of the time and influence American cooking and kind of some of the events and other things that were happening at the time um, to influence all of that together. So, like I said, if you have any questions, drop them in the chat and we're gonna go ahead and get started. Oh, I always do this. I have to click on the thing and then I can use the arrows. Okay, so we're gonna start with the Columbian Exchange. So this is a term that was coined in the 1970s. Some historians are trying to figure out a better um, word for it, but it's essentially when Europeans first come to the Americas, um, there is an exchange of a lot of things that the Europeans bring back to Europe and also that they bring um, across the Atlantic Ocean to the quote unquote new world. Um, Europe, Africa, and Asia, I think get the better end of the bargain <laughs> um, because so many foods that we think of as belonging to these other countries or being indigenous to these other countries are actually indigenous to North and South America, primarily Mexico and Central America and Peru. Those are the big um, agriculturalists that are developing a lot of these foods. So for instance, you might think of the cassava and peanut being endemic to Africa, but those foods are actually brought over by the Portuguese from South America. Same thing you might think, when you think of tomatoes, you might think of Italy. Tomatoes are developed in the Mexico, Central American region and brought to Italy, to Naples in particular by Spain because in the 16th century, Naples was part of the Spanish empire. You know, potatoes, you might think of Ireland or Germany or Scandinavia or Britain. Nope, they're from Peru. So all of these super influential foods in our, now our global cuisine are actually truly American. They're indigenous to America, the Americas, North and South America. And they were raised and cultivated and bred by indigenous agriculturalists. The flip side, um, what comes to the new world from the rest of the old world, um, probably the most influential foodstuffs are sugarcane, uh, grain, and livestock. Another really hugely influential import into North and South America is disease. Um, basically, we probably would not have had the level of colonization that we did, particularly in North America, um, had disease not preceded the colonists. And a lot of people, you know, the, um, uh, the pilgrims, right, in Plymouth, uh, they talk about, oh, there's all these fields, and this is, it's already all cleared, this is a great place to build a town. Well, guess what, that was a town, but everybody died, right, because these diseases were traveling along indigenous trade routes, and there was just no natural immunity. So, 
Um, historians estimate that hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of people died of disease, generally in advance of any European colonization. Um, so like I said, I think the rest of the world got the better end of this bargain. But that's kind of where we're at if we're talking about early American food. We have all of these indigenous foods, some of which reach North America via Europeans, right? It doesn't necessarily come from South America up to North America. Uh, and then we also have all these European, Asian, and African food ways that are coming to North and South America. All right, so we're gonna be talking specifically about the United States. So when I say American foods, I am going to be using it colloquially to refer to the United States, even though America is North and South America, but that's what we do in the United States. Um, so the ones that we're primarily seeing in early America, the indigenous food ways that have the biggest impact in um, early colonies are pumpkin, corn, some ways we use corn here, cranberries, turkey, maple syrup, and beans, right, are the most influential in North America. Um, cooking in early America, and this is just some context, we can understand some of the cookbooks we're going to be talking about. Cooking in early America um, revolved around an open hearth. This image is from the 1830s-ish. Uh, and you can see the hearth is the center of the room. It takes up almost the whole wall. And there's this big um, gray cylinder in front of it. That is called a tin kitchen. That was for roast, spit roasting meat. It had a reflective back to reflect the heat back into it. And you see there's a giant cauldron, right? Um, your meat production was very seasonal. We don't really think of meat as being seasonal today, but it was, and it kind of lingers on in our language. Like if you know the term spring chicken, you've heard that term. That's actually a term referring to the young male chickens, the young male roosters that you would harvest in the spring as soon as they came up to wait for your meat chicken. Um, and then otherwise you wouldn't really harvest chicken uh, until maybe your hen stopped laying and then that would be like a stewing chicken, right? And then in the fall, you also had spring fish runs, but in the fall, you'd butcher your pig, you'd do hunting, you'd butcher your cattle, um, and then you would preserve or salt that meat, pickle it sometimes to get you through the winter to the spring. So it was very seasonal, even in terms of your meat. I put boiled on there because there's references in historic cookbooks to boiling meat. And I just wanted to explain that that doesn't mean it was at a hard boil. In the term, in the period, that term just meant that you were cooking meat in a liquid rather than roasting it. Your food ways were also hyper local. <clears throat> if you were not growing or foraging it yourself, you were buying it from your neighbors. That included flour, right? So you have grist mills in throughout the 18th and into the early 19th century, you have grist mills in every community. Um, and you're either grinding your own grain or you're purchasing surplus from your neighbors. Uh, and then eating was very seasonal. I talked a little bit about the seasonality of meat, but you know, the seasonality of food in general, um, particularly once you get into the spring, you know, if you miscalculated and you didn't have enough food to get into the spring, you might be fasting for a couple of weeks um, before the greens are coming up, before the fish are running, things like that. So a lot of the focus is on food preservation. And most people throughout the world at this time period, their primary occupation was making sure that they had enough food. Growing food, hunting for food, foraging food, preserving food, cooking food. Um, that was people's main focus in life. Not so true anymore, right? So who was doing all this cooking? So until the early 19th century, throughout colonial America and the early new nation, um, slavery was legal, including in the North, including in New York. Uh, and enslaved people were generally directed to do the heaviest, um, most difficult, uh, manually difficult labor. So in the kitchen, working in an in a early American kitchen was not easy. You're cooking over an open fire. It's hot, especially in the summer. Your cooking utensils are quite heavy. There's a lot of cast iron. You have to haul wood. Um, you have to regulate 
the temperature of the wood, you might have multiple fires going at once. You have to haul water, right? A lot of the, especially in wealthier households, um, a lot of the higher class foods were higher class because they were more labor intensive. Like if you've heard about beaten biscuit in the South, um, that was a very labor intensive food. It's eventually mechanized, but early on, it's just an enslaved person beating air into these into this biscuit dough for hours, right? For hours. Same with like um, cakes. Before we get chemical leaveners, they had to be uh, leavened by egg whites. So you'd have to whip egg whites for a long time, right? Have you ever tried to hand whip cream? Your arm gets tired pretty quick, but people did that all the time. Uh, the other thing that's happening because of enslaved people is we get a lot of influence from West African food waste. So most of the people who are enslaved in the United States, the Caribbean and South America are captured from the coast of West Africa. Um, that's our primary location where enslaved people are coming from. So if you know of Philadelphia pepper pot stew, that is like straight up West African cooking, <laughs> that style of cooking. So it does influence. We also get some African foods like okra is an African food and some African techniques in, in cooking a lot of our food. So a lot of what is Southern food or considered Southern food is really West African. If you lived in a very wealthy household, um, you could afford to employ a French cook um, or in the case of Thomas Jefferson and his enslaved chef de cuisine, James Hemings, a French trained enslaved cook. Um, and just a note that slavery in New York was legal really until about the 1840s. We have our gradual manumission law in 1799, um, but that includes some indenture laws for um, children born into slavery between a certain time period or born to enslaved or formerly enslaved parents. Um, and it's like, I think it's 28 years for young men and 24, 26 years for women. Um, so yeah, it's really until about the 1840s that the last of those indentured people are finally set free. Also, New York was highly involved in the illegal slave trade I learned recently, but we're not gonna talk about that tonight. All right, so how is knowledge about cooking transmitted in early America. One of the ways that was done was with manuscript cookbooks. And the cookbook that's pictured here is Martha Washington's manuscript cookbook um, that she wrote for her daughter from her first marriage, Nellie Park Custis, right? So before she married Washington, George Washington, she had a previous marriage with children. And her daughter, Nellie Park Custis, um, she wrote this manuscript cookbook for her. It's handwritten. It's not in any particular order, but Mothers would create these documents. Sometimes it would be multiple generations in one book, right? They would create these documents of important recipes, difficult to remember recipes, um, food preservation recipes, household recipes for like laundry, recipes for medicines and stuff, because this is before the widespread use of doctors. A lot of doctors were quacks. So, and quite expensive. So you wanted to try your home remedies first before you called a doctor or a surgeon. Um, so they're kind of all over the place. If you wanna read Martha Washington's manuscript cookbook that she wrote for Nellie Park Custis, um, Karen Hess did transcribe it and published a version in 1981, which you can still get copies of. Um, it's pretty interesting. It's such an interesting mix, but it's really reflective of a lot of those like community style cookbooks where it's not like, here's the recipe for what you're gonna make for dinner tonight. You're expected to already know that having grown up cooking or being trained in person by your mother. Um, the manuscript cookbook is for like, you know, the giant fruitcake you're gonna make for Christmas and you don't remember the ratios off the top of your head or, you know, oh, I really wanna make mom's spiced peaches, but I don't remember how, how much cinnamon to put in or things like that, you know? That's the kind of thing that's, that's in there, the more special occasion recipes or the more complex or difficult recipes. Uh, our first published American cookbook is The American Cook, published by an orphan um, who later is revealed to be Amelia Simmons. The first edition was published in Hartford, 
1796, and that same year, a second edition was published in Albany, and that's how popular it was. And it's considered the first American cookbook because of the ingredients. So obviously there were other cookbooks available in the United States in colonial America prior to this time. Most of them were British cookbooks. Most of them were designed for wealthy households and focused on household management. Um, and even though some of these ingredients were available in England at the time, especially pumpkin, um, they didn't really have recipes for that necessarily. Um, it's also designed for households with few to no servants. And servant was a euphemism from the 18th century that also meant an enslaved person. Um, but it could also mean a white person who was paid to do household service. Um, so it's kind of very like classically New England, working middle class, egalitarian style cookbook, which is sort of a radical departure from, from what typical cookbooks were of the past, which was largely focused on you know, royalty and the wealthy um, and people could, who could afford to have really complicated large scale dinner parties and feasts and things like that. There's a lot about etiquette and hiring and firing of servants and all that stuff. None of that is in Amelia Simmons. It's like, how to economize and how to use leftovers and how to use all these local ingredients. Um, it is the first to call for pearl ash, which is a precursor to baking soda. It's a chemical leavener. Uh, and then interestingly, this is way before we have copyright law, right? So it plagiarized quite a bit from British cookbooks, right? The non-American ingredient versions. And because we didn't have copyright law, it was itself plagiarized and republished under different names. Um, one woman republished it under a different name and just copied it wholesale. Like she didn't even rearrange the order of the recipes or change anything. It was just exactly the same cookbook under a different title. So it was popular enough that it got plagiarized a lot. Um, this guy, this is the only man I'm going to talk about tonight. <laughs> and he's the only non-cookbook author, but he's really reflective of what is happening in the United States and in Europe um, as they industrialized and urbanized. So Frederick Hume was a German chemist who published a treatise on adulterations of food in 1820 in London. And if you follow um, the uh, public domain review, usually at Halloween, they publish you know, the cover of this book, um, which is a skull and crossbones in a cauldron and it says death in the pot. You know, It's usually a later edition. Um, but he's essentially using chemistry to ex expose food adulteration. So food adulteration is when you add non-food ingredients to food in order to make it cheaper or to stretch it or to make it look better. So that's things like putting plaster of Paris in flour or you know putting pebbles in whole black pepper <laughs> to make it heavier, right? Or you know putting bluing in milk to make it look whiter, things like that. Um, and this is in direct response to urbanization. So we're starting to get some commercial food production, right? As people are moving into cities, you're no longer necessarily buying from your neighbor. You don't necessarily know where your food was created and who made it, right? You're just going to a store, to your local general store or some sort of importer, right? And you're buying food and uh, you really have to trust that person not to cheat you, which is not always possible in large cities. Um, so the interesting thing about this book is that he does not call for any kind of regulation, federal you know, government regulation or anything. Uh, it's basically on the consumer to be smart enough and educated enough to know the difference between adulterated and non-adulterated foods. Uh, and we don't get food regulation in the United States until the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. So it's really not until over 85 years later after this book is published that we get any sort of substantive regulation. Even then it takes a couple of years for the regulations to kick in. So just an interesting reflection of what is happening with food at this time period. All right, this next section I'm going to call the art of home cookery uh, in large part because that is reflective of the style of housekeeping and cooking and hospitality that was popular in the first half uh, 
of the 19th century. It spills over into the second half of the 19th century, but then we start to get some conflict at the turn of the 20th century. But it's this idea that, you know, you, cooking is an art, keeping a beautiful home is an art, being a good hostess is an art, right? Something to be valued and how things look is important as, as, as important as how they taste and how filling they are, right? So our first uh, star of this section is Mary Randolph. We have a nice picture of her here. Uh, she is related to Thomas Jefferson and also by marriage to the Custis Washingtons. So her husband was related to the Custis Washingtons. Um, she's apparently descended from John, John Rolfe and Pocahontas. So like she's got Virginia royalty basically in her background. Um, and her husband lost his job when Thomas Jefferson left office as president, right? So she, in order to make ends meet, opens a boarding house. And in 1824, publishes the Virginia Housewife. Um, she dies in 1828, it's so only four years after the publication of, of the cookbook, which is really sad. Um, and she's buried at Arlington House, which at the time was the home of George Washington Park Custis. It's now known as the Robert E. Lee House. Uh, and it's in the middle of Arlington Cemetery. So she was the first person to be buried at Arlington Cemetery, which is kind of cool. Uh, her cookbook, The Virginia Housewife, The Methodical Cook, is super fascinating. It's available for free. It's been digitized uh, on the internet. I recommend you check it out if you're interested. It's Southern cooking, but kind of elevated. There's Spanish recipes. There's French recipes in there. There's a ton of vegetable recipes, including the tomato, which was still kind of controversial at that time. And a lot of people theorize that many of the recipes, particularly the French recipes, may have come from um, James Hemings, who was Jefferson's enslaved chef de cuisine. Because for instance, she has a recipe for macaroni and cheese, which he basically brought over from France to the Americas. No one was really making macaroni and cheese before <laughs> he brought it over and really helped popularize it. So, so there's, there's some theories that she was influenced a lot by that because of the close relationship um, with Jefferson in that household. All right, our next cookbook author in our Art of Home Cookery series, you may have heard of her, Lydia Maria Child, another local-ish lady, um, most famous for the Over the River and Through the Woods poem, um, also known as a New England Boy's Song of Thanksgiving. Uh, she was a writer pretty much her whole life. Uh, she starts out as the editor and founder, really, of one of the first periodicals in the United States directed specifically toward children, which is called Juvenile Miscellany. Um, she publishes The American Frugal Housewife in 1829. It's actually The Frugal Housewife in 1829 and then republished in 1832 in London as The American Frugal Housewife uh, because apparently the Brits already had a cookbook called The Frugal Housewife. Uh, and that's really her only cookbook, but it becomes really popular and super influential. But her politics get her into trouble. So um, she starts out as a novelist. Her first book was called Hobomoke, uh, and it includes a storyline of a white woman marrying a Native American man, which did not go over well in a lot of communities. Um, in 1833, right after the publication of her second version of the American Frugal Housewife, she wrote an appeal in behalf of that class of Americans called Africans. Um, so she's an abolitionist, she's a Native American rights activist. And when that starts to get out, that news starts to come out, um, subscriptions to juvenile miscellany take a nosedive. Uh, and she actually steps down as editor. Uh, Sarah Josepha Hale, who we'll encounter a little bit later, steps in for a couple of years, but eventually uh, the periodical folds. So she is really punished for her political beliefs at the time period because, of course, this is the time of the uh, Indian Removal Act under Andrew Jackson and the Trail of Tears with the Cherokee. This is a time of, you know, boiling over sentiments about slavery and abolition. Um, and so a large swath of the South decided uh, they didn't want anything to do with her. And that really affected her her livelihood and her book sales. So interesting. Although that, that cookbook still persists. 
Another interesting cookbook author is Catherine Beecher, sister of Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is pretty much the best-selling novel of the 19th century. Um, Her Catherine Beecher is a huge proponent of women's education. In 1823, she opens the Hartford, Connecticut Female Seminary, which is basically like a high school slash finishing school for girls. Um, she's an advocate of Sylvester Graham, who was a health reformer and religious leader. He goes on to influence um, Ellen H. White and by extension, John Harvey Kellogg uh, with the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, and if you know about Graham Crackers, they are named after him. So Graham Flower is the one thing that persists in all of his rather ascetic advice about food. Um, and that is entire wheat flour. It's not the same as whole wheat flour. Modern whole wheat flour is just white flour that they've added some of the wheat germ back into. Um, Graham flour or entire wheat flour is ground from the entire wheat berry. It's not separated or sifted at all or bolted as it was called in, this, in the period. She also opposed the Indian Removal Bill and was an advocate of Native American rights and this is the interesting part. She was anti-suffragist. Her two sisters were not. They were proponents of women's rights to vote. Catherine Beecher was against it, um, which seems surprising today, but actually fits in pretty well with the whole art of home cookery thing. Uh, she likely ascribed to the idea of Republican motherhood where you need to have educated women so they can educate their sons and then their sons go out and make a difference in the world and the woman's place is in the home and she influences through the home. Um, so I'm guessing that's where that comes from. But uh, interestingly, <laughs> she publishes a bunch of books. Um, the two most famous are probably Miss Beecher's Domestic Receipt Book. Receipt is another uh, way of pronouncing the old fashioned spelling of recipe. And then probably her most famous one, she writes with Harriet Beecher Stowe, which is the American Woman's Home, which is a cookbook and household manual. And it's an interesting read. Most of these are available digitized um, on the internet if you wanna track them down. So who was cooking at this time, right? We're in the 19th, mid 19th century. So who was cooking? All right, so slavery continued in the South until after the Civil War. And as we know, it was after the Civil War, Juneteenth is coming up this Saturday. So we know that despite the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, a number of enslaved people were not actually freed until 1865, usually because the Union soldiers came marching into their communities to enforce it. Um, Post-Civil War, most households of any means had at least one female servant, right? If you were poor or maybe if you lived in a really rural area, um, you might just have the women in your household, but if you lived in an area where you could afford a female servant, you would have one. Wealthier households had professional cooks. And interestingly, in this period leading up to, and especially after the Civil War, there are a lot of free Black women and also some widowed white women who start catering businesses. That's mostly free Black women. Um, and tea rooms, in addition to, you know, running boarding houses. That was one of the few ways that were acceptable for women to make money in this time period. So if you were widowed or if your husband was, you know, otherwise incapacitated and you owned your home, um, you could operate a business out of it. And, and food businesses were among the most popular. So boarding house meant you had people stay in your house, right, for a fee. But tea rooms or catering businesses, you know, you could just run that out of your house and people didn't have to stay over. And I put Solomon Northup's wife, Anne Northup, on this list because she was a free Black woman who was a professional cook in Saratoga. So in the Saratoga Spa District, um, she cooked in hotels professionally, uh, and that is how she supported her family while her husband, Solomon, uh, was captured and sold into slavery on a Louisiana sugar plantation which if you know anything about slavery and sugar, sugar plantations are some of the most brutal um, working conditions for enslaved people in the United States and the Caribbean. But he survives, he eventually comes back um, and she supports their family the whole time 
while he's gone through her cooking skills. So that's just one example. All right, throughout the first half of the 19th century, there are a bunch of other cookbooks that aren't quite as influential, um, but they are interesting. And the thing that they all have in common is that they are all very regional, regionally focused cookbooks. So we have the Kentucky Housewife, the Southern Gardener and Receipt Book. I love some of these names too, Latisse Bryan, Phineas Thornton. My personal favorite, everybody's cook and receipt book designed for Buckeyes, Hoosiers, Wolverines, Corn Crackers, Suckers, etc. by Philomelia Hardin. We have the New England Economical Housekeeper, the Carolina Housewife, Table Receipts Adapted to Western Housewifery, right? So this is all what's going on in the 1830s through to the 1850s. These are the kind of cookbooks that are being published in the United States, which sort of makes sense because up until the Civil War, a lot of people identified themselves by their state first and being American or from the United States second. And that is kind of a holdover from the colonial period when we were separate colonies and not necessarily unified under a federal government. That starts to change in the 19th century, but it's not until really after the Civil War uh, that people start to identify themselves as Americans first. So these cookbooks, sorry, are reflective of the regionality of American food at that time, which as we talked about before was really influenced by what was available locally um, and what you, how you grew your food. Sorry, the sun is setting and I don't have a curtain. I'm sorry, you guys, I'm seeing that lens flare there. It's very dramatic. Anyway, you did have some limited imports, uh, staples like flour and salt were produced locally. So in New York, we have the Syracuse salt mines, right? Uh, you also start to get regional varieties of fruits and vegetables through seed saving. And then you also start to get some regional specialties um, based on immigration. So you get the Pennsylvania Dutch, which is really Pennsylvania Deutsch, right, from Germany. Uh, Yankee cuisine is obviously from England, right, New England. There's the Carolina Rice Kitchen, um, which is pretty heavily influenced by West African foodways. You have Tex-Mex, you have in Louisiana, there's Cajun and Creole. You know, you start to develop some of these foodways uh, based on immigration patterns as well. So that starts to change around the mid 19th century and especially the second half of the 19th century. And women's magazines play a big role, I think, in starting to make that shift. So um, we have here a picture of the cover of the Goni's Ladies book, edited by Sarah Josepha Hale, uh, who is famous today because she's the one who convinced Abraham Lincoln to give us Thanksgiving as a federal holiday <laughs> through a very lengthy letter writing campaign. Um, but these magazines, and you might recognize some of the names on that list, because they're focused on women, you know, they have fashion and stories and things like that, but they also have a lot of recipes and cooking advice. And once we get into the 20th century, you also start to have home economists and other food experts. So readers are writing in for advice, they're exchanging recipes, um, but a lot of these magazines were based in the Northeast. And so they kind of set the fashion in food Right, and so you start to see this reflected in some community cookbooks like where everybody's got a recipe for lemon pie, right, or everybody's got a recipe for a lobster Newburgh, regardless of whether you're in New York or California or Minnesota, right, we start to get this national identity of food through the popularity and, and kind of fashion of what was being set as what was fashionable in these magazines. Um, there are a couple of other things that are happening mid 19th century to help homogenize American food waste. The big one is the rise of railroads. So we start to get a little bit more access to certain foodstuffs with um, the uh, canals, the opening of the canals in New York and Ohio in the 1820s and 30s. But it's really the rise of railroads in the, the late 1830s. Um, that starts to change things. So Cincinnati in the 1840s is known as Porkopolis because that is a huge 
um, pork raising and meat packing district. Um, a lot of the South was uh, feeding its enslaved population with salt pork from Cincinnati. A lot of westward expansion was fueled by bacon and salt pork from Cincinnati. And then of course, after the Civil War, we get cowboys, right? Many of whom are black, which not everybody knows, but it's a lot of freed slaves. It's a lot of former Confederate soldiers, right? Become cowboys and we get Texas Longhorn beef. And the reason why we're able to have beef so often, especially in the latter half of the 19th century, is because of railroads. So those cattle drives would go up to Kansas City and they'd pack all of those uh, cows on a train to Chicago, to the meatpacking district. And then from Chicago uh, on ice, on refrigerated railroad cars, which by the way, were refrigerated with ice until like the 1940s, which is kind of crazy to think about, but because you had access to ice, you could ship that beef throughout the country, right? So all of a sudden there's a lot more access to beef. You start also with railroads to get the rise of cash cropping. So, you know, if you're in Florida, everybody can grow oranges in Florida. So there's not a huge market for your Florida oranges, but guess what? They can't grow oranges in New York. They can't grow oranges in Chicago. <laughs> so through the use of these railroads, you can get a specialty crop to much further markets where they will pay a lot more money for it. So you start to get the development of states specializing in certain crops that are well suited to their, their um, soil and, and local climate. Uh, you also start to get urbanization. Americans don't like to stick around. So even though in the early part of American history, we did, didn't have, we had travel, but not quite so much. Like you probably weren't gonna move that far away from where you were born. By the end of the 19th century, Americans are all over the place. So because of that, you're not able to put down roots and develop specific foodways. And also living in cities, you're much more divorced from, from the food production, right? So you start to get divorced from the seasonality of food, thanks to railroads and refrigeration, which is all ice fed in the 19th century. Um, and you, you know, we were buying from a butcher and a greengrocer and you know, so it's it's less influenced by what is available seasonally and locally. You also start to get a rise in canned goods. So during the Civil War, Union soldiers got a real taste of canned food, largely condensed milk, thanks to the Bordens, who are from Texas. But um, by the end of the century, you definitely have a holding here in New York. And uh, canned peaches become super popular. So. Commercially canned food, soldiers experience that during the war and they, they develop a taste for that. So they start to ask for it more when they're at home, right? And then in the 1870s in particular, the, the commercially canned foods really start to take off. The um, technology improves um, and people are experimenting with different things and there's just a much wider availability. You also get a rise in brand names. So with canned foods in particular, um, and really at most processed food in this time period, it was really regional and not necessarily, it was like a company, but they didn't necessarily advertise their company because they just knew if it was available, people were gonna buy it, right? But you start to get the rise of brand names expanding outside of their local and regional communities in large part because of reliability. So I have this little thing here, you need a biscuit versus the Cracker Barrel. You need a biscuit is just the best, <laughs> <laughs> the best name ever for a company. And that develops in response to the Cracker Barrel, which was a barrel of crackers, which are like, they could be either more like hardtack or pilot crackers or oyster crackers, or in some instances, they were more like British biscuits, like they could be sweet and flavored. But they were sold in a barrel, they were sold by the pound. If you went to the general store, the clerk weighed it out for you, measured it and weighed it out for you, and you just sat in a chair and told them what you wanted and they did it for you. And, uh, you know, depending on the quality, you might not, if you don't know where it's from, it could be stale, it could be damp, it may be broken if it's not very sanitary necessarily, depending on the cleanliness of your store. And you need a biscuit. It was all packaged individually and, you know, all a uniform shape 
uh, probably not broken, you know, sealed in these wax paper packages, so they were more sanitary. And that's kind of the story of a lot of um, brand name foods is that they're kind of taking the risk out of purchasing it. You know what you're going to get when you purchase it, even if it's more expensive, it might be worth it to have that consistency. All right, now we're getting toward the end of the century and we're really starting to develop some celebrity around cookbooks and cookbook authorship. And one of the first real celebrity cooks is Maria Parloa. She's one of my favorites. Um, she has a really interesting backstory. She's orphaned at a young age. She learns to cook in hotels and boarding houses, working in hotels and boarding houses. <clears throat> and uh, she moves to Florida to attend normal school, which is like teacher's college because she wants to be a teacher. And she ends up teaching cooking classes as a fundraiser for her church because she's a Sunday school teacher. And the cooking classes are so popular that basically she decides to abandon her career as like a school teacher and open a cooking school, which she does. She moves back up north after publishing her first cookbook and opens a cooking school in Boston. Then she moves to New York City and opens a cooking school there. Uh, and then like 10 years later, she retires from teaching to write full time. Um, and in the 1890s, she becomes one of a couple of ladies who are among the first cookbook authors to endorse products, which we'll get into a little bit later. So her very first cookbook was the Appledore Cookbook published in 1872. That's what kind of launched her into cookbook authorship and um, running her cooking schools. She's a fairly prolific cookbook author. This is not all of the books that she wrote. Um, so she's writing from 1872 until her death in 1909. And then uh, during World War I, um, a little pamphlet written by her was published posthumously. These are a couple of examples. I love the camp cookery one because it's published in 1878 and it's literally about camping. And it's not like, it's like actual practical advice about what to take when you're going camping, which I find fascinating because you wouldn't think the 1870s would be a really popular time for camping, but it's a great little cookbook. Also digitized, you should look it up. All right, this is another early celebrity cook, Sarah Tyson Rohr. Um, she is interesting because she was educated at a cooking school, like that's where she learned to cook was at a cooking school. Uh, in 1884, she opens her own cooking school in Philadelphia, which I'm sure pissed off the cooking school that she went to. Um, and this is something that a couple of the women I'm going to talk about do tonight. Uh, she managed the East and West Pavilions at the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904. So if you've ever seen Meet Me in St. Louis with Julie, Judy Garland, that's about the St. Louis World's Fair of 18, 1904. And so managing these big food pavilions was like a really prestigious thing. And a lot of cookbook authors, if they did something like that, or if they won awards or whatever, they would put it like on the inside of their book uh, to kind of prove their authority to the reader. She also wrote for magazines. She really becomes one of the most famous cooking teachers of her time. She's a prolific cookbook author. Um, sadly, she loses everything in the Great Depression and she dies destitute and alone. She never married in 1937, which is pretty sad. Um, but she's a very prolific author, like Maria Parloa. She's one of the first um, cookbook authors to endorse products and to write cookbooks for companies. Um, one of my favorites of hers is actually uh, a vegetable cookbook that she wrote for the Burpee Seed Company. So it's like you bought, if you bought seeds from Burpee, you could write them and they would send you this book. And you might think it would be like a little you know, like 20 page cookbook. No, it's like a huge, huge hardbound cookbook all about vegetables. Also available digitized online if you want to check it out. And then our third celebrity cook who was one of the first to endorse products is Mary Lincoln, Mary Johnson Bailey Lincoln, not Abraham Lincoln's wife, right? She was a homemaker, she was married with kids. Um, and she becomes a very early teacher at the Boston Cooking School. So her husband was basically not able to work and she actually was forced into domestic service, which means she worked as a servant, probably a housekeeper um, or possibly a cook in someone else's house. 
right? Um, and in 1879, when the school first opens, they actually invite her to teach, but she doesn't think she's qualified. So they hire Joanna Sweeney and Maria Perlow instead, and Lincoln trains with them, uh, and later becomes a teacher, and then the first principal of the Boston Cooking School. And she is super influential in terms of how she writes her cookbook. So this is kind of a little example of some of the tension that's happening between the art of cookery and the science of cookery, right, that's happening around this time. So she integrates chemistry and nutrition science into her cookbooks, which are directed at regular women, right? So it's not that people weren't doing chemistry and nutrition research at the time, but she's one of the first to integrate it into her cookbooks and, and have a little bit more scientific approach. Not as prolific as some of our other cookbook authors. Um, her very first one being Mrs. Lincoln's Boston Cookbook, What to Do and What Not to Do in Cooking. Uh, and then I also love one of her later ones, The Pure Food Cookbook. 1907. Remember we talked about Frederick Akim in the 1820s and we didn't get food regulation until the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906. So what's she do in 1907? She writes the Pure Food Cookbook, right? Being savvy with her marketing, hopping on that bandwagon. So the three of these ladies, Maria Parloa, Sarah Tyson, Sarah Tyson Roar, and Mary Lincoln, um, all three of them actually co-wrote or submitted recipes to a cookbook by the Cotoline Company. And Cotoline was a competitor of Crisco. So it produced vegetable shortening. Um, the vegetable part being cottonseed oil, which Crisco is probably around still because they don't tell you that. <laughs> and then this lady you probably know, right? This is our other famous Boston Cooking School alum. Uh, Fanny Farmer, probably the most famous of our early 19th century celebrity cooks. She's known as the mother of level measurements and she's holding a little measuring cup in the picture here. So, um, you know, standardized measuring utensils did exist prior to her, but a lot of people didn't really use them necessarily or weren't sure how to use them. So prior to these standardized measurements, you basically had to make your own standardization. And there was a little bit like a teaspoon and a tablespoon, you know, the cutlery was pretty close. The teaspoon is the spoon you used to with tea. The tablespoon is the spoon you used at the table, right? Tea cups and wine glasses were relatively similarly sized. Um, so when you were cooking at home, you would just have utensils that you use the same ones every time, right? And so you kind of learned to adapt your recipes based on that. But here she's saying, no, you have to have level measurements, no mounding, right? No scooping with a mound, no scooping spoons that are heaped, right? Everything has to be level. So you have to take a butter knife and level everything off. And her, her real um, claim to fame, I guess, what her influence was she designed her cookbooks and her recipes that if you followed the instructions exactly, you were going to replicate what you should be replicating by following the recipe. A lot of the recipes prior to this, they were starting to get better as we get on into the 19th and into the 20th century. Um, but a lot of recipes is like a list of ingredients or it would say like, you know, make as for pancake batter or put in a cake pan and not tell you what size or, you know, and then just bake until done, right? What temperature, how long, you know, <laughs> none of that was really, uh, articulated because you were kind of expected to know it already. But Fanny Farmer was like, no, there are people who don't know how to cook or they're bad cooks. So I'm going to help them with how I write my recipes. So she actually trained under Mary Lincoln, but then left and opened her own school, which I think left a little bit of bad blood between her and Mary Lincoln. Um, she had a paralyzing illness as a teenager. She was bedridden for a number of months. Um, and although she regained her ability to walk, for the last seven years of her life, she had to use a wheelchair. And because of that, I think she becomes very in interested in an invalid cookery, right? Which was cooking for the sick. And she becomes such an expert in this that she's actually invited to lecture at Harvard Medical School, which was not typical for women, right? You might be able to attend, but probably not gonna be a lecturer, especially not for men. But she becomes a really big expert in this field. Again, not as many cookbooks as some of her predecessors. Um, but obviously the most famous one being the Boston Cooking School book, um, which is now known as 
to most people as the Fanny Farmer cookbook, right? So it gets named after her and these are just two editions. So another person who's not much of a cook actually, but ends up being super influential to food in the United States is Ellen Swallow Richards. Um, she's known as the mother of home economics. She studied at MIT. She looks like one of the first women to be admitted to MIT into the chemistry department. She had originally studied um, astronomy at Vassar, but thought that there might be some more job opportunities for her if she switched to chemistry in graduate school, so she did. Again, she's a woman, so if you want to study chemistry at MIT, it's got to be food or laundry. Those are your two options, and she does write on both, but her focus is food. Um, and she is one of the first to apply chemistry to food in an academic setting, right? Uh, this is in the 1870s and 80s. In the 1890s, uh, one of her only forays into like public cooking is the New England Kitchen of Boston, uh, which is a charitable organization designed to have like inexpensive nutritious food for immigrant families for their target audience, probably with some um, hopes of Americanizing them. But guess what? Immigrants in Boston were like, we don't want to eat your sad, you know, beef hash and blancmange. We want to eat our food that reminds us of the home country. So it ended up just serving, you know, shop clerks and, you know, uh, clerks and shop girls. So it was not a success. They had to shut it down. She also managed the Rumford Baking Powder Kitchen at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. So again, she's kind of adding to her laurels. And she publishes a number of books, only one of which really is a cookbook, which is Plain Words About Food, the Rumford Kitchen Leaflets. Uh, she also writes about food adulteration in the 1880s, but most of her books that she writes are pretty academic, right? Health and labor camps, right? It's not, not what your typical housewife is going to be reading. So why is she on this list? Why is she on this list? Um, she's on this list because of this tension. So turn of the 20th century, we're really starting to get some knowledge about nutrition science, right? The conventional wisdom is that we know about fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Vegetables are kind of worthless because they're mostly just water and roughage, right? Until we start discovering vitamins, but that's really not until the 19 teens that we start discovering and isolating vitamins. And those discoveries continue until after uh, World War II. Uh, we do also start calculating calories. Calorie is a measure of, um, is a measure of heat energy that was originally applied to steam engines. And in the 1890s, William O. Atwater applies it to people and calories become kind of a fad. Um, and we have this tension in food between science and art, right? And also self-taught and university educated. So Ellen Swallow Richards is a little bit of a snob. Um, she hated the term domestic science uh, because domestic doesn't only mean like associated with the home, it also is referring to a person who works in service. So a domestic is a servant. And a lot of cooking schools were actually not really geared towards ordinary housewives. They were geared toward working class women who are either in service to a wealthy household or who were going to you know, open tea rooms or catering businesses or things like that. Um, so there's a little bit of a taint to that according to some people like Ellen Swell Richards, who's university educated, so she's a little snobby about it. So this is a little bit of a watershed moment. In 1899, we have the Lake Placid Conference hosted by Melville Dewey of Dewey Decimal fame. Uh, he and his wife hosted a conference every year on different topics. The 1899 topic was home science and household economics. Uh, Ellen Swell Richards was there, Maria Parlow was there, a couple other women influential in domestic science, again, that term that Ellen Swallow Richards hates. And this is where they coined the term home economics, is at this conference. There's only 11 people there the first year. They continue to meet annually. Uh, by 1908, when they formed the American Home Economics Association, there's 200 people attending this conference. And in 1909, um, Ellen Swallow Richards founds and publishes the Journal of Home Economics. She dies just a couple years later in 1911. Uh, but the Home Economics Association is still around. 
and so is their academic journal. I think it's under a different name, both of them now. Um, but that ends up being hugely influential because it's basically establishing this academic course of study that a bunch of women in the 1900s, 19-teens, 1920s will go on to study and then they will get jobs afterwards that will be influential and we'll get to that later. I squealed when I found this picture in the Cornell University archives. That's Ellen Saul Richards in the front. Um, I don't have all the ladies identified, but that is very clearly Mar Maria Parloa in the back there in the rocking chair with the cameo. So this is on the porch of the, the Dewey home in Lake Placid. So pretty fun to see those ladies together. All right, remember we talked about home economists? They get to be a little bit influential with the development of convenience food, right? So now we're in the early 20th century. We have a rising middle class. There is a decline in household help, right? Largely because we have the rise of other jobs that are available to young women, particularly working in retail establishments. Uh, we have an increasing availability of canned goods. We have better and better refrigeration. Um, we start to have frozen foods. Not very good frozen foods. This is before Clarence Birdseye, but they're around, they exist. And we have much more industrial food production, right? So convenience food really starts to help out um, the middle-class American housewife who maybe cannot afford it, who cannot find household help. Uh, it also helps out people who, you know, maybe the husband is a junior executive at the bank and his wife doesn't work and their, their uh, household income doesn't go very far and they live in a little kitchenette apartment, right? A one or two room apartment with a closet for a kitchen. So a lot of these convenience foods start to become really popular. Um, so we start to get the development of corporate recipe pamphlets that starts really in the 1870s, um, but really takes off in the 20th century because a lot of corporations, food companies and corporations start to hire these newly minted home economists who are coming out of their four year college degree programs. Um, they also start to get celebrity cook endorsements like we talked about. Uh, and basically there's a finite amount of certain foods that people wanna eat. Campbell's is a great example. How much soup are you gonna eat in a week? Probably not that much. So how are you gonna get people to eat more of your product? You gotta figure out other ways to make stuff out of it. And that's where the home economists come in. So that's where you get the cream of whatever soup being used in all these casserole dishes. That's where you get, you know, tomato soup spice cake and things like that, or 101 ways to use marshmallow fluff, right? These are the kind of things that home economists are doing in the, the corporation test kitchens. Um, I do also just want to take a little aside in reference to the convenience food. Um, the Young Bride cookbook is a trend, right? It starts out kind of with like the manuscript mother to daughter cookbook. Um, but by the 1920s, you get the clueless bride. So this is a young woman who maybe grew up in a middle class household where there was a servant who did all the cooking. They went to high school, maybe they went to college. They didn't really learn any household management skills because it wasn't fashionable. Right, and now they're married to their junior bank executive and they have to keep house and they have no idea what they're doing. So you start to get a lot of cookbooks focused on helping young brides set up household, helping young brides learn how to grocery shop, helping young brides learn how to cook, right? And corporations are happy to step in and help because we have this great little um, cartoon. This is one of many. And I'm going to take a little drink of water because I'm going to read it to you. So this is for Spry, which starts out as lard, but by the 1930s, when this is from, also did vegetable shortening. And it's Aunt Jenny starts a bride off right. And Aunt Jenny was like the mascot of Spry. All right, here we go. I'm going to do the voices. You ready? <clears throat> Your cookbook is the grandest wedding gift, Aunt Jenny. And here's a big three pound can of Spry to start you off housekeeping. It'll keep fresh and creamy right on the kitchen shelf. A week later, I'm proud of my spry cake. So light and delicate and velvety and mixed in a jiffy. 
Spry is so wonderfully creamy. I just love to use it. Next evening. Marvelous fritters, darling. So crisp and tender. And Spry doesn't smoke or smell up the house. Boy, isn't this pie crust tender and flaky. You're a grand little cook. Thank Aunt Jenny and Spry. It'll save lots on our food budget, too. Right? So that is Spry hitting all of those buttons, those fears about young brides. They don't know how to cook. You know, she's going to smoke up the whole house. She's going to go way over on the food budget because she doesn't know how to grocery shop, right? So Spry will solve all of your problems, young bride. There are dozens of these little cartoons. If anyone wants to check them out online, they're super fun. I just want to mention that uh, people loved your accent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yes, I, I cultivate the, uh, the um, 1930s, what is it, the transatlantic accent. I tried. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I was a theater kid, in case you can't tell. <clears throat> anyway, so that's one little trend that's happening in the early 20th century is the Clueless Bride cookbook. Um, the other thing that's happening that's slightly influential in cooking, but is really kind of a blip on the cookbook um, history is the First World War. Women's clubs are super influential in war, uh, wartime food preservation and conservation. Uh, World War I has voluntary rationing, unlike World War II. Um, the emphasis is really on food conservation, saving food, and not eating specific types of food in order to free up supplies to send overseas to the allies and to our troops. Uh, we have the rise of war gardens, which after World War I become renamed as victory gardens in 1919. Uh, and so we have the proliferation of community canning kitchens. People are doing a lot of home food preservation. Uh, these, these are the victory editions, right, from 1919 of a couple of pamphlets that are produced throughout the war by the National War Garden Commission. Uh, and I love the one on the right. It's one of my favorite propaganda posters. It's also a poster. And it says, canned vegetables, fruit, and the Kaiser too. And then it's Kaiser Wilhelm. And the label says Kaiser brand unsweetened, which is just one of my favorites, right? So it's ironic twist. Normally it's the military language that's being used on food. This time it's food language being used with the military. All right, so post-war into the 1920s, another one of my favorite celebrity cookbook authors is Ida Bailey Allen. Um, she starts out as a food editor of the Sun in New York American. She becomes a pioneer in radio broadcasting. She founds the National Radio Homemakers Club. Radio homemaking persists through to the 1970s in some communities. Um, she also writes for a bunch of magazines. She's the first female food host on television with Mrs. Allen and the chef. She's not the first, it's not the first cooking show necessarily because she's not actually doing the cooking. She just invites chefs onto her TV show. There is a little snippet of audio that's been digitized on the internet um, that remains from that. And she is a prolific, prolific cookbook author. She authored over 50 books. Um, all the way from her first cookbook in 1917. I actually just got this summer um, a 1918 cookbook by hers, which I'm really excited about. She wrote a bride cookbook. And then her last cookbook was published the year she died, Best Love Recipes of the American People in 1973. Um, my other favorite cookbook of hers is the Money Saving Cookbook from 1942. Uh, so it is a wartime cookbook, but it is just... It has so many interesting and fascinating recipes in it. It's all stuff that I want to try. And also just genius things that you wouldn't think of. Like if you have leftover macaroni and cheese, stuff it in a tomato and bake it, right? As a way to stretch that little bit of macaroni and cheese to feed, feed a crowd by putting it in a tomato. I was like, that's genius. Why didn't I think of that? That's the kind of, the kind of recipe she has. So she's great. I love her. Um, after the 1920s, right, we fall pretty quickly into the Great Depression with the crash in 1929. So with the Great Depression in the 1930s, you have kind of Hollywood versus reality, right? So there's the Hollywood version on the silver screen with all of the beautiful 1930s stars. Um, and then there's the reality for a lot of people, which is much different 
Uh, the Dust Bowl does affect the country differently depending on where you are. But I put Dust Bowl cooking on here because it's a real, the food becomes a real hardship for farming families. A lot of farms in the 1920s and 30s uh, were still relatively subsistence based. You might have a cash crop, um, but you were not buying food. You had kitchen gardens, you had livestock um, to feed your family, and you didn't have any of that during the Dust Bowl. So the food became really focused on commodities, um, you know, cornbread, biscuits, lard or vegetable shortening, white sugar was cheap and easy to get. And then maybe it's like salt pork and beans, right? And that's, that's pretty much your diet. Ground beef, if you could get it. So you do also start in this time period because people are poor. <laughs> You have the rise of what I call Americanized ethnic foods. Now these are different from um, like Mexican American cuisine and Italian American cuisine and Chinese American cuisine. There's a lot of rhetoric around authenticity in American food ways that I kind of reject because I'm like, if you're Chinese and you're cooking this food, <laughs> if you invented it, that's Chinese American food. Um, what I'm talking about is the white people version of those foods. <laughs> So you start to get things that are just basically all variations on ground beef, which was the cheapest cut of meat you could buy pretty much. Um, so with Mexican food, you get the rise of things like tamale pie, which is just ground beef and canned tomatoes, probably home canned tomatoes, maybe a little onion, maybe a little chili powder. And then you put cornmeal mush on top and you bake it. I saw a recipe for that the other day on like a modern recipe website as like being all cool. And I was like, oh my God, it's coming full circle. Um, Italian food gets really popular. Pasta based dishes get really popular in, in the Great Depression, macaroni and cheese, spaghetti and meat sauce or meatballs, that kind of thing. Um, Americanized Chinese food gets really popular, like Americanized chop suey, which again, it's like ground beef and noodles and onion and maybe some green pepper. With a little soy sauce if you're feeling adventurous. If you have money, you might put some canned mushrooms in there. <laughs> like that's that's the kind of food that that comes to the forefront during the Great Depression. And then also at the same time, and this is true of pretty much any time we have any kind of economic crisis in the United States, people get super nostalgic for the past, right? So we have the colonial revival. There's a real concern about the loss of regional foodways, which has been kind of ongoing for the last hundred years, but you get the WPA Federal Food Writers Project to try and preserve some of those food waste. That kind of starts in the 1930s. Also in the 1930s, you might recognize this lady, Irma Rombauer. She embarks on this project um, after her husband dies by suicide in 1930. She's never written a cookbook before. And her little influence in food waste is she has head notes, really chatty, comfortable, friendly head notes. And uh, unlike our Fanny Farmer, who tends to be kind of stern and scientific, we have the joy of cooking, right? Cooking is a joy. Let's be interested in it and, and excited about it. So she self-publishes her first edition in 1931. She kind of gets ripped off, to be honest. She ends up paying more than she makes. But her cookbook becomes so pop popular that it's picked up for commercial publication in 1936. There's a bunch of different versions, including a wartime version for World War II. Um, and people still cook from Joy of Cooking today. My favorite pancake recipe that I have memorized that I cook all the time is right from the Joy of Cooking. All right, in World War II, a little different than World War I, we have mandatory rationing with ration stamps. We have we revive our victory gardens from World War I, but there's even more emphasis on them in World War II as a, a way to kind of fill out your rations. Um, there's a huge emphasis on home food preservation to, to free up commercial, um, commercial canning for you know, shipment overseas and for use by the troops and for people who can't have victory gardens. Um, and we also have, a, we've discovered a lot of information about vitamins and nutrition in the interwar period. And we're doing even more Department of Defense funding researching vitamins. And part of that is because in 1941, with the onset of the draft, um, a report comes out that says 
of America's young men are malnourished. Now, it's not actually that number. Historians have gone back and looked at the original data. That's not actually 40%, but that's the number that's reported in the time period and people like flip out about malnourishment. I don't know why it was a surprise to people. We're still in the Great Depression when we enter the war, people are still poor and struggling to eat. Um, but that really spurs a lot of investment in research into nutrition science and vitamins. And one of the results of that is in 1946, once the war is over, we get um, the School Lunch Act, which is a way to prevent malnutrition among America's children. So I'm sorry, I'm flipping back and forth. I just wanna talk a little bit about this propaganda poster right before we go, because I think a lot of people now think about World War II as kind of like this, yes, we're all gonna to work together toward a common goal and kind of romanticized version of it. But there's always this little undercurrent of kind of sinister anxiety, if you know where to look for it. And this propaganda poster is a good example. It's a very famous one. It says, it's this cute little blonde girl talking to her mom in their matching outfits, which is apparently a very 1940s thing. And she says, we'll have lots to eat this winter, won't we mother? Because they've canned all this food. But the implication is if they hadn't canned all that food, they might not have enough to eat that winter. So there was a lot of anxiety around food supply during World War I. And so you see that kind of reflected in the cookbooks. You have a lot of emphasis on vitamins. You have a lot of emphasis on like reusing leftovers and not wasting anything and food preservation, right? A lot of the victory editions of existing cookbooks is just a little section in the back. Um, and most of it is canning recipes. So, all right. Also talking about vitamins, we have Adele Davis. Um, Adele Davis is known as America's nutritionist in the 1960s and early 70s. Um, she's a university trained home economist and nutritionist, and she promoted um, a, a very World War II influenced diet, although it was largely regarded as quackery at the time. So she really emphasized nutrients, vitamins, and minerals. So she was an advocate of eating lots of organ meats, right, because that's where most of the minerals and vitamins are concentrated, a lot of milk, like she put skim milk powder in everything because she thought milk was the perfect food. Um, a lot of her cooking methods are to preserve vitamins. She emphasizes whole grains, less, way less sugar. Like if you're gonna use sugar, you should use the blackstrap molasses because that's where all the vitamins and minerals are, like all the nutrients. Um, and she also invents yogurt and granola she doesn't really. They were present in the United States for a long time before that, but she helps popularize them among, you know, young hippies, essentially. She published a number of books. Her most popular and probably best known one is Let's Cook It Right from 1947. Um, but she gets into a little bit of trouble with her subsequent books. So she kind of decides to shift from nutrition and cooking into medical advice, and she's not an MD. So she is a proponent of mega dosing of vitamins um, for health reasons. So this is a thing that's going on in the 1950s and 60s. Um, a number of famous people jump on this bandwagon, including two-time Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling, who won both a Nobel Pri Peace Prize and a Nobel Prize for science. Um, and the idea is that if you take mega doses of vitamins, they can cure things. Linus Pauling is the reason why we think vitamin C will cure the common cold. It does not, but he wrote a whole book on it. And so she puts a lot of this advice into her subsequent cookbooks. Um, but in the 1970s, two children die because their parents took advice from her books. Um, one parent tries to treat a childhood illness with vitamins. It doesn't work. The child dies. They don't go to the doctor. Um, the other child uh, dies of a vitamin overdose. And when that happens, the medical establishment, which has kind of been like ignoring her as like a crank, um, basically went back and looked at her last three books that she published, Let's Have Healthy Children, Let's Eat Right to Keep Fit, and Let's Get Well, which she has thousands of citations in. And they look at all the citations and they find that she's either misattributing them, right? So it's not actually, she's not actually citing what she thinks she is, or she's misinterpreting the data. So she gets pretty much discredited. Um, she dies of cancer in the 70s, which is ironic because mega-dosing of vitamins was supposed to be a thing that cured cancer that did not work for her. 
And it makes me sad because her nutritional advice was actually pretty sound. Like that's what modern nutritionists suggest. Whole grains, low sugar, whole fruits and vegetables, you know, lean meats, milk. People still recommend milk. That's, that's all advice people still take today. So, all right, post-war, right? We have all of our deprivation and rationing in wartime. Um, as the GIs come back from overseas, they start to bring an interest in international cuisines. French haute cuisine, particularly in the 1950s and 60s, gets super influential. Um, we have the return of fat and sugar, kind of with a vengeance, right? We abandon all that <laughs> World War II advice on nutrition, and we're just like, yes, bring on the processed meat and the sugary breakfast cereal and butter and cream on everything. You have rising prosperity, right? But we kind of got used to not having servants in our houses. So a lot of people still rely on convenience foods, right? The housewife is alone, usually in the kitchen, not true everywhere, but definitely in a lot of households. Um, there's trust in corporations as experts. That's something that persists really until the 1960s counterculture movement. Um, and speaking of French cuisine, you probably recognize this lady, Julia Child. Uh, she was born in California in World War II. She worked for the Office of Strategic Services, which is where she met her husband, Paul Child. Um, after the war, they, he was stationed in France with the OSS. She decided she didn't want to work for the OSS anymore as a secretary. She thought that was boring. Um, so she decided she wants to learn how to cook. And uh, she ends up writing a cookbook with two French women about French cooking for American audiences and leverages that into a career as a cookbook author and a professional cook chef. She's one of the first television chefs, not the first, one of the first, uh, and definitely probably the most popular. I think she probably had one of the longest running cooking shows of anybody. She did actually write a lot of cookbooks. I think everybody focuses on mastering the art of French cooking, but she wrote a lot. Um, if you haven't read My Life in France and you're interested in Julia Child, I definitely recommend it. It's published posthumously, but it's all about, you know, her and Paul and the whole story of the, the writing of Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And it's just fascinating. I really recommend it. There they are, volumes one and two. All right, in the 1970s, um, we start to get colonial revival with a vengeance. So colonial revival starts in the 1920s and 30s. Um, it's really popularized in the 1940s as, you know, kind of like a patriotic thing, harkening back to our founding. But approaching the bicentennial of 1976, um, you get a ton of interest in food. So there's regional food ways revival. There's interest in food history. You start to get historic sites interpreting food like Old Sturbridge Village and Colonial Williamsburg, places like that. You have the recording of oral histories. Um, you have the authoring of memoirs, particularly about food um, prior to World War II. And this cookbook, I included because this cookbook was super influential in my life. Um, it's the Grassroots Cookbook by Jean Anderson. It's published during the bicentennial hype. Um, and so all of the regions that are listed there on the cover what she does is she goes to each region and she interviews one person in each region about their life and includes some of their recipes. And it's just a really fascinating read. If you like to read cookbooks, you will enjoy this book because there's so much background information about a lot of the recipes. Um, and it's just great. Found it at a thrift store when I was in high school, helped set me on my path of food history. <laughs> it took me a while to actually get there, but this is definitely definitely an influence in my life. So that's why I included it. All right, also kind of influenced by the bicentennial um, a little bit is Chef Edna Lewis. Another fascinating life. Uh, she is born in rural Virginia and raised in rural Virginia. She moves to New York City at age 16, has a bunch of jobs, including working for a communist newspaper, uh, before she ends up as the restaurant cook in 1949 at Cafe Nicholson which is a very hopping, very artsy place to be. In the 1960s, she breaks her leg and Judith Jones, who is the editor at Knopf, Alfred A. Knopf, and the person who said yes to Julia Child's Mastering the Art of French Cooking, mm -hmm. encourages her to write a cookbook. 
so she does. She's not the very first, but she's probably the first modern um, African-American celebrity chef and cookbook author. Um, she publishes the Edna Lewis cookbook in 1972. My personal favorite is The Taste of Country Cooking, which comes out in a bicentennial year, 1976. That is all about the food that she cooked growing up in rural Virginia. And she doesn't author that many books, but she is hugely influential among other chefs and food writers. Um, there were a lot of stereotypes about Southern food and like soul food and stuff in the 70s. And she kind of just blows them all out of the water at that point. Um, so she's really influential in that, in, in that way. All right, so now we're in the 1970s, right? So we get a little obsessed with health in the 1970s and particularly in the 1980s. There are a couple of studies that come out in the 60s and 70s about heart health. Um, much of which has since been disproven, but we get really obsessed with fat reduction, right? In the 70s, there's a health food craze. We get tofu, whole grains, yogurt, lentils, all kind of enter the lexicon of ordinary Americans. Obviously, all these things existed in the United States for a very long time, um, but they don't get super popular among a broad swath of America until the 1970s. In the 1980s and 90s, we have an obsession with fat reduction. So it's like egg white omelets and, you know, boneless, skinless turkey breasts and snack wells and low fat yogurt and all that fun stuff. And then kind of on the other end um, of things, we have the organic movement starts to take off. And that's influenced in part by Alice Waters and Chez Panisse and uh, the new California cuisine. So Alice Waters had been in France and experienced food in rural France. So not the haute cuisine France that was very popular um, in that time period in the 50s and 60s, but she goes to France and is eating like, you know, French peasant food. <laughs> and she realizes that the quality of the ingredients is part of what makes that food so good. And she's like, I live in California. This is the salad bowl of the country. We have amazing ingredients in our backyard. We should cook with those and show that American food can be just as good as French food, right? So that's what she did. Um, throughout the 80s and 90s, we've got renewed interest in international cuisines and more interest in more authentic, non-immigrant, American immigrant versions of international cuisine. So there's Japanese cuisine and sushi. We have like minimalist food become super popular. Remember baby vegetables? <laughs> Remember when that was a thing? Um, thanks to people like Alice Waters, you start to get a rise in farm to table restaurants and the new California cuisine. Southern Italian peasant food, particularly Tuscan food has like a big revival in the 90s. Mexican food has a big revival in the 80s and 90s and Southwest food, right? With the likes of like um, Diana Henry and Rick Bayless. And then we have the Silver Palette Cookbook. And maybe you've heard of this, maybe you haven't. Uh, published by Julie Ross and Sheila Lukens in 1982. And it wins the James Beard Award, obviously. And it introduces, you know, kind of this international flair. Also, French is on this list, but it is very high in French food ways as well. Um, and it, the thing that it does is it makes scratch cooking seem easy. You know, this is a time period when there was, you know, a bajillion microwave cookbooks and a bajillion diet and low fat cookbooks. And you know, box of this, can of that cookbooks. And this really doesn't have any of that in there. It's all whole food scratch cooking and it made it seem easy and normal. And this cookbook goes on to influence, again, like Edna Lewis, a whole generation of chefs and food writers and cookbook authors. If you've ever had chicken Mirabelle, which is um, bone in chicken cooked with olives and prunes, that comes from this cookbook, right? So, you know, more casual dining starts to kind of pick up on a lot of these style of recipes. All right. We're getting away from our cookbooks a little bit. Yes, do you have a question? No, but I was going to say that I just had that for dinner. You had chicken for dinner? <laughs> I did. did you know it was from the Silver Palette cookbook? Do you have that? 
Oh my gosh, I'm that's hysterical. So funny. I am hysterical, literally. That's so funny. What a clinky <laughs> dink. <laughs> now we're all gonna have to go make chicken marabou for dinner this week, I think. <laughs> all right, so in the 1980s and 90s, we start to get more celebrity chefs on TV besides Julia Child, right? We get Martin Yan with Yan Can Cook, Lydia Bastianich. The Food Network is founded in the early 90s. Um, yeah, I just think that's kind of crazy that Bobby Flay has been on the air since 1994. Um, and then you also get food tourism, right? The late, great Anthony Bourdain, I miss him so much. Um, and that really starts to be influential. So this really starts to influence how people are cooking. We get like these celebrity chefs, right? Which we kind of had in the 19th century and then we revive it in the late, late 20th, early 21st century. Um, and they really start to crank out the cookbooks, right? Pretty much any anytime you walk into a bookstore, you're gonna see celebrity faces on cookbooks these days. All right, this is my last slide. 21st century food, our trends are more dietary, right? I put medical vegetable primeval. So, you know, gluten-free, dairy-free, vegetarian, vegan, paleo, which I hate as a diet, not because I actually hate the diet, but because it is not at all paleolithic, even close. Now the new trend is clean eating with like Whole30 and keto. We have a revival of heirloom fruits and vegetables in the 21st century in the last 20 years. 20 years ago, it was almost impossible to find an heirloom tomato in a grocery store. Now they're everywhere. Um, everybody talks about food, but who's actually cooking? I mean, hopefully since the pandemic, hopefully more people are cooking. <laughs> But, you know, there's a trend of we're going to take a picture of our food at a restaurant and share that rather than what we're actually cooking. And then there's also a lot of race and class issues that are coming to the forefront with food. So there's farm to table is as popular as it was when um, Alice Waters introduced it. But there is a lot of barriers to people accessing that style of food. And there are food deserts. And a new term is a food swamp, where food is abundant, but it's none of it's good for you, right? So a food desert is where it's really difficult to obtain affordable, fresh, nutritious food. So that is in both urban and rural areas. Um, and these are kind of the challenges that are facing us as we talk about food and cooking in the 21st century. So I hope you can still hear me. Thanks for sticking it out, man. We, can, we still hear you. Good. And I see we have some questions in the chat. Yes, we did. I just want to also mention that we had Lydia Bastianich at the library. So uh, there was a while ago, but I think you could still get it on our archived uh, programs. So that's so um, cool. So uh, the first one. Oh, she, when you were talking about uh, the vitamins and minerals, she says it's no wonder diet and health recommendations are still constantly changing vitamins and minerals and food being discovered only 100 or so years ago. We know so, so little about the most important part of our lives. And then yeah, there's and that's, that's actually um, that has come up recently in the media about nutritionists mm -hmm. and how like 1940s style a lot of their food recommendations still are and how difficult it is for you know communities of color and immigrant communities who don't eat that way it's like dream deemed white people food you know like salads and like you know a grilled chicken breast with vegetables that's not how a lot of people in this country eat so there's been some criticism of that style of nutrition advice but then also doing good scientific studies of nutrition is really hard. You have to do it for a long time, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have to do it with a large population and both of those things are very expensive. And nutrition science also has a really bad habit of not, um, not, ri ri oh, what's the word I'm looking for? When a study comes out, nobody tries to replicate it. So it's like this study comes oh. up, it's like coffee is good for you. <clears throat> 
And other scientists don't necessarily go back and try and replicate the study to see if they get the same results, which is what they do a lot in other scientific fields. That doesn't really happen in nutrition science. So I always say if anything new comes out in nutrition science, take it with a grain of salt because we don't know a lot of the time. Right. Well, an article today in the New York Times science section was about coffee and how yes. coffee can be right. You know, the caffeine it is good for you and yet there's some negatives. Right. And so it's very hard to figure out what to do. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, just everything in moderation, man. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the best advice you can give. That's I your best it. course of action. Um, somebody left a link. And I'm going to try to, I'll copy it. Um, yeah, I mean, I. you want me to share it? I just popped it yes. up on my screen. If you yeah, could I'll share, share that link, too. that would be wonderful. Yeah, That's so what, this is the link that Peg shared, um, all about uh, the earliest black cookbooks. And yes, she said, look at the picture. There's a tin kitchen Yeah. right in front of that hearth. Yep, that's what right. she's referencing. It was interesting. Well, the entire talk was wonderful. Oh, I, I, 1880, that is late. Oh. oh, what do you see 1880? Right in the caption from Lyman. Oh, 1880, Lyman. yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Yeah, that looks yep. like it's from, you know, 1780. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Yeah, this is a cool article. Yeah, there's some interesting early, um, early cookbooks there. This one by Melinda Russell, I, I should probably add it to my to my list of cookbooks. The problem is this is not particularly influential because like nobody knew about it until a couple of years ago. Um, but uh, it's a fascinating story. She, as a young woman, tries to get to Liberia. This is like in the 1820s. Mm -hmm. um, she's trying to get to Liberia, which is like the back to Africa movement and she gets robbed. And so she becomes, um, a cook in order to support herself and her disabled child and then has to like escape the civil war and ends up in michigan and she writes the cookbook as a fundraiser to try and raise money for herself and her kid so the stories yeah. were fascinating thank you i mean i'm not a cook but i just loved and i am going to try macaroni and cheese stuffed in a tomato right Isn't that the best <laughs> idea I love it. Sounds so good. Yeah, if you have leftover macaroni and cheese. Right, sounds you wonderful to me. Those big giant tomatoes at the store. Yeah. Yep. Right. So um I thank you so much. And I think most of us, I mean I never thought that know. much about the history of food. And I just loved every second of this. Great. And the that time just flew that. by. So um it will be on our archived website which is on our website, which is chappaqualibrary.org. Just give it a few moments, a few weeks, uh, a few days. And also you could recommend it to friends. I mean, all of our programs are videotaped and they're, they're used, they're highly used, especially if it's a cloudy, rainy day and you're looking for something. I mean, this is, I was laughing half the time with you and uh, loving the rest of it. So it's Great. a wonderful way to spend, um, let's see, well, how long, about an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah a little longer. So. It's a long so program. I, I do have a couple more recorded talks that are on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. If you want to check them out, if you just search the food historian on YouTube, I should pop up there. So Sounds like a good idea. Yeah. So thank you all. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Sarah, so thank much. You I will keep your um, information, believe me, and I will recommend you. Okay. This is how I found you. you. Okay. So thank you all for coming and we'll see you again. Don't forget to go to our website, chapacallibrary.org. Thank you. Good night. Good night.